Thanks, Jordan. Um, right, my turn to be uh, interrogated today. And I'm welcome, um, I've got a fantastically experienced and um, eminent um, <laughs> Must be him. pair of <laughs> interlocutors. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, Daniel uh, Petri to my right here, who's the uh, co-founder and partner of Airtree Ventures. And further away, uh, Bill Bartry, who's the uh, formerly the co-founder of Blackbird Ventures and now co-founder or co-founder of M Main Sequence Ventures. Welcome, guys. Thanks. Now, a um, lot of experience on the stage, and you've obviously seen the Australian technology startup scene grow. Um, Bill, if I could sort of turn to you briefly. Um, you were co-founder of Blackbird, which is now one of the Australia's most successful and, and biggest uh, firms. Mm. Um, wh what was the motivation when you, you started that? And, and then let's like br bring it up to the present day. Uh, yeah, so the motivation really was there was a sort of, we saw the next generation of technology companies and entrepreneurs who were forming, and there seemed to be a gap in the market. Um, there's an accelerator here called Startmate, and this was kind of what do you do after Startmate? So we saw a whole bunch of entrepreneurs forming um, interesting companies, primarily SaaS companies at the time, thought that um, that would make sense from an investment point of view. So I got together with my other co-founders, Nikki Shavak and Rick Baker, and we formed a small fund called Blackbird uh, and, and started away. Um, and that was four or five years ago now. But um, y you know, what, did you, what, did you, what was the opportunity that you saw? Well, I mean, look, we saw companies like Canva and Safety Culture and Culture Amp and Autopilot and a whole bunch of, uh, of companies that were forming, and we saw a new set of entrepreneurs who were young, vibrant, energetic, had a whole bunch of new ideas and, and, and were solving a bunch of new interesting problems, and we thought, look, we want to be part of that yeah. uh, from an investor point of view, and so that was the opportunity that we saw, and, and at the time, um, you know, Airtree was forming as well, or you guys had just formed, or? No, we were behind, yeah. yeah. Well, we d we, we, we d we're having a hiatus between then, us and Airtree. Yeah. We were seeing what we want to do when we grow up. Right. Know, so we were. Yeah. I we still haven't sure. figured that out of you. You know, oh, okay. <laughs> I keep doing it every you five years. You haven't figured out what you're going to do no, when you grow no, up. No. Um, sounds a bit like me. What, um, Daniel, I mean, y you similarly obviously saw an opportunity. Um, what, what do you think is qualitatively different about Australia, say, five, ten years ago, uh, look, and, yeah. and, and now? And look, I think, I think you know, so, so, you know, Airtree's at uh, my third fund. Our first two funds did four times cash on cash. So I've been doing this for 20 years, mm. a successful inventor in Australia. I think you go back uh, 20 years ago, most venture was a bunch of investor and bankers who came out and sprinkled pixie dust over the landscape and hoped for the best. And there were some successful companies out of that. Very, 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 very few successful funds. Um, the super funds who backed those ran for the hills because the money went to zero, and we had this sort of um, drop. The other thing about that go going back is that the cost of a startup was so expensive. You know, in, in the first fund, you know, a startup was $5 million. Our second startup in 2006, our second fund, it was like $1.5 million. So one of, the, you know, one of the things that's, that's fueled this has been the incredibly low costs of a startup, particularly a SaaS startup. Yeah, yeah. You know, because, you, you know, a, a, well, viral marketing and the code stack, you can borrow parts of the code and the cloud. So you have these sort of variety of things going on. You have the cost of the startups coming down dramatically. That's a global phenomenon. You have the ability to build scale quickly. And the, the, the other change has been the arrival of capital yeah. in Australia, which has been the, the, the latest thing. And the combination of those has allowed there to be this resurgence in startups in Australia. Would you agree, Bill? Oh yeah, a absolutely, and there's a couple other factors too, and that is that we started seeing some of the entrepreneurs who had made some money begin to recycle some of their dollars back into the system. So, you know, Mike Cannon Brooks, who was just on a little while ago, he started to make a number of investments, that did a number of the other significant entrepreneurs. And anytime you sort of start, start see some of the more successful entrepreneurs put some of their money back into the system, that, that just fuels it. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing too, quite frankly, uh, from my point of view, is that, um, <coughs> You know, what we're now seeing out of university systems here is we're now seeing a set of students who are coming out and who actually want to start businesses. Whereas 10 years ago, that was not the case. They wanted to go to work for, you know, IBM or, or a big law firm or a big accounting firm. And now it's no longer that. It's like, you want to get a job? No, I want to start a business. So that sort of whole kind of cultural revenu revolution at that student level has now taken place. And, you know, no matter, you, you can go to every university now in, in Australia and, and see an accelerator. Yeah. Whereas 10 years ago, you couldn't see that. One of the problems in Europe is um, the way universities hold on to intellectual property and tend, 
you know, the university, the classic university in incubator that uh, where a company, go, you know, tries to go somewhere and doesn't, it's like an engine starting, it doesn't really work. Sure. Is that, is that uh, something that's going on in Australia as well or, or is it getting better? I, I think um, Bill's case is, is more often it's the individual students, not so right. much in the university funded research. I think the university funded research, particularly in Australia, we've punched above our weight in medical research, particularly in biotech and, and gene work. And that's if there is this balance of like where should the returns go. Yeah. And I don't think that they're holding it back, but they are looking for decent returns. And generally, yeah. though, the, the incubators in the university, they're just students right. who, are who, are create, who, who have gone into incubator as, a, as an electric engineer student or a computer science student or whatever and building a startup. So it isn't a, as much. I think you've got a different issue with CSIRO, though. Yeah, yeah I, well, I, th I think it's, it's, a, it's an immature market, if you will. Um, there are some universities here, for instance, that are really, really good at this and others that are just learning how to do it. Mm. Um, we had one experience recently, for instance, where we formed a, a company with a professor out of the University of Sydney, and I have to say they were awesome. I mean, we went through the entire process of getting something done with them in probably six weeks, uh, which is pretty darn good. Mm. I, I was actually surprised, <laughs> pleasantly so. Um, whereas uh, other universities, you know, want to hold on to IP and they think, look, IP is going to make or break mm. you, and we all know it's execution, mm. right? Um, so, um, look, it's uh, it's uh, various degrees of uh, maturity depending upon the university you're at. Yeah, the, some of the hottest companies coming out right now, like CultureAmp, etc. Yeah. Um, do you detect a sort of a theme in this new generation of companies? Do, do either of you detect a, a particular type of theme, or is it across the board? No, I, I think it's a general thing. I think, I think generally speaking, probably Australia are uh, underrepresented in hardware, and that's probably appropriate because I think you know hardware is a particularly different industry to, to to software of any form. But I think across the software landscape, I think it's pretty um, pretty general. I do think there are cases where um, thematics get lost. You know, in Australia today, you know, apparently e-commerce is a shit place to be. Um, I <laughs> can't quite understand that. But but why do you think that? Why do you think people think that? I think. Often in Australia, there's a very um, uh, not well thought through uh, thematic about a sector. You know, oh, e-commerce, that's equals Amazon, everyone else is dead. Well, that's clearly not the case, not even in America, you know, where there are, are verticals that, that survive well or, or related verticals. So I think... Y y you're in shoes of prey, aren't you? Well, yes. You were. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, you know, that was a very, uh, <laughs> very, very vertical, you know, um, sort of a... You know, <laughs> of a play, and uh, I, you look. I know more about women's shoes than I ever thought I would. Um, yes. You know, I, I can tell you what a lot about uh, shoes. Uh, well, uh, yeah. I don't have any daughters, but I, I know more about women's shoes than probably Daniel does, who has three daughters. Three daughters. Yeah. 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 And but um, there are there are some successful e-commerce companies coming out of Australia. You've um, actually, Daniel, you've been criticizing. Uh, I noticed everyone. So um, oh, okay. <laughs> 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 it's a long list. Good right, for let's good let's start. Alphabetical. You alphabetical. Let's cover Macquarie first. <laughs> yeah. You said. Retail Armageddon in Australia will be worse than the US experience. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, first, if you look at Australia, all our industries are oligopolies, pretty much. Um, they're all run by three or four companies, run by old white men who wouldn't know innovation if it bit them on the ass. Um, just because I'm an old white man doesn't make you can, shouldn't laugh at that. Um, <laughs> and run by boards of old white men, so there's, no, there's zero innovation. Look at the financial services sector, the banks, or the insurance companies, the retailers. Mm. So you have that anyway applying. And then you have in retail this kind of weird belief that Amazon won't, Amazon or Amazon like service offerings which won't work in Australia, which is just ridiculous. So I, I do think Australian retailers will be um, hurt far more than their American um, counterparts. The reckoning is coming. No question. That's good. It's great for consumers. Bill, what do you think? I, I think he's right. I mean, you know, for years, um, you know, I, I've lived here 20 years, but for years when I was first living here as an American, I would uh, order Christmas presents, right? And, and I would order them online in the U.S. and have them delivered here because it was so much easier and there was just no online shopping at all here. And I thought that was very weird. And then all of a mm. sudden, you know, it just caught on mm. with the Australian consumer. And now there's probably more online shopping per capita uh, in Australia than there is in the U.S. I think that's right. Um, but I, I, do you I think do that's something to do with distance? Uh, well, uh, no, I just think it, you know, finally it caught on that, look, it's convenient, it's cheaper. I mean, if you can get Amazon books delivered to your house for uh, half the price that at a local bookshop, why not? But I do think that there is a lot of sort of backwards thinking, and, and yeah. I do agree with Daniel here in, in, that, in that, you know, if, if, if you're not going to be proactive and try and have a, a, a real strong strategy going forward, a lot of these companies are going to get eaten alive. Yeah. yeah, I think that one of the great opportunities in Australia is because mm -hmm. our, our industries are so boring, 
and run by boring <laughs> people, that, that smart entrepreneurs who see a market opportunity will, will get to scale faster here, I think, and <coughs> than they should in, a, in their US equivalent. I mean, even in, even in the area of, of e-commerce, you know, everyone said that Iconic was never going to work as a disaster. Now, I've got, you know, as, as you mentioned, three daughters who, and I'm not sure any of the women or men in the room, who will order, order a, well, the men may not wear a dress at night, they may, but they order a dress at two in the afternoon, it gets delivered by four, they go out, they go out uh, at night with it. Now, I don't know if you heard that marriage equality just got voted in yeah, yesterday. Yeah, that was, this is, uh, is cross-dressing, a slightly different, okay. but anyway. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> but we can explain that later. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but the, the, well the I'm point really being not sure where to go with yeah, this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> the, the, point, the point being that I think that, you know, I've, I've heard massive retailers, fashion retailers a year ago saying there's no way that that iconic, you know, delivery model will work, that no one will order a dress at, at 11 in the morning for to wear that night. And I know, you know, hundreds of young women who are doing that every day. So, and yet that was happening overseas two or three years ago. So yeah. it's this weird thing that with the internet, you know, there's this weird thing like, Google, you can like search shit, it's amazing. And you can see what's happening overseas. And you can, so the idea that you, you pretend it's not happening, even though it's happening, is a very weird Australian thing. What yeah. do you, I mean, Oh, and the, the other thing too is, you know, I, I haven't seen him in a dress, but I'm sure Daniel, he's got really, yeah. <laughs> he probably <laughs> looks great. <laughs> That's good. I've got photos, it's good. Okay. <laughs> um, d a serious point though, is oh, okay. um, because you, you, Daniel, you've actually said a lack of competency among the nation's corporate leaders is compounding the challenges that is facing Australia. What do you mean? In it, you said old my, white men, etc. But you know, I mean, there, are, there are kids coming out of university. There are competent people. What do you mean? What do you mean the lack of competency? What Look, do you I, th mean? I think um, the way Australian boards are structured is to focus on governance because that seemed to be the, co the only thing that matters. And so you don't right. get focused on strategy. You don't mm -hmm. get fo focused on R and D. If you look at these top, top Australian hundred companies and you parse out the the um, res meds or the coculars, the obvious innovators, and you parse out some of the mining companies, you look at the sort of banking sector or retail sector or uh, FMCG, and you compare them with their equivalents overseas in the US, so you like for like, mm -hmm. you'll find that a J&J or a P&G is spending between 9 and 13% of revenue on R&D, and that's over the horizon products. The Australian equivalent is spending 1%. So there's a fundamental lack of understanding that R&D of over the horizon products should drive innovation and that should be understood at a board level and a management level. And I think that, that whole thread is missing. That's why I mean lack of competency. Right. And, and because it's an oligopoly set yeah. of companies well, here, it, you know, you just, I mean, look, price fixing is illegal, right? But it probably happens <laughs> anyways. Well, uh, it's, yeah. it's great that you, ma great you mentioned R&D because Bill, you're um, leading a new program, CSIRO, aren't you? Yeah. Um, yes, w w which was giving out a, a $200 million innovation fund with CSIRO to look at uh, the next generation of Wi-Fi chips, cutting edge cancer diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Tell us about that. Tell us about that R&D kind of capability. Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, wha what we're trying to do is more D than R. Um, okay. So we're not, we're not interested in, in, in um, sort of prolonging the, nec the next science experiment. We're looking for those entrepreneurs who want to solve really hard problems with a deep tech solution mm -hmm. in general. That's, that's sort of where the focus is. And, um, you know, similar to what Daniel but says. Obviously, there's a lot of confidence that you uh, put so much into. You, you have a lot of confidence that you're using, in, given the amount well, look, there's of, a lot of, of the Well, look, there's a lot of smart people here, right? Yeah. There's, there's no lack of brains. I mean, that's not, that's not the issue. Sure. The issue is how do you actually translate some of this stuff and make it into a real business? Right. So that's what we're trying to help with. Um, and I, I think it's a, you know, it, it's a big job, but I also think, you know, everybody's al always heard that Australia is great at inventing things, but hopeless at commercializing them. And, and that's not far from the truth in a lot of cases. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to help that a little bit, and we can do things inside CSIR or inside universities, and also we can also invest in companies that are outside of all of those organizations, but maybe have some link back where somebody at CSIRO could um, help improve the product set or something like this. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the other enablers that we're going we're gonna to need in Australia, uh, we're seeing in the UK, is like the open banking regime in the UK where um, you know, banking data anonymized is open for fintechs to, to train their algorithms, if you will, for service offerings. Mm. And I think the way you, you attack monopolies in this country, oligopolies, is you ensure there are open data regimes. So whether it's around, yeah. around retail or around yeah. banking or around <laughs> he health, anonymize, you're not actually going after the individual, but you're sure. understanding the, the, the demographic set of your, of your buyer. I think that will allow a lot more startups to develop and scale and, and create compelling offerings. And it's probably more required in Australia, that sort of data access regime, than it would be in the US. Yeah, right. and I, I think one other thing, just to uh, add to that, is that if you look across the entire uh, landscape in Australia, and you look at all the tech jobs, the one job that I consistently see that's missing, or where there's talent missing, is product management. Mm. 
So, and, and the reason is, I think, that in the U.S., um, you have, and, and Europe, you have companies who are plugging big systems into big enterprise customers and doing lots of sales, and they have to sit between engineering and the customer. Yeah. You just don't have as much of that here. Mm. Um, and if we could plug that hole, yeah. then I think there's a whole bunch of but, but, but good I mean that leads. To, I mean, that, that probably, I don't think capital is mm. an is issue at the moment in the Australian venture market. I think that, you know, two billion was raised last mm. year. I think Blackbird's raising another big fund now. And there's, th you know, if you've got a good idea, you can get money. I don't think that's the that's issue. That's being solved. That, that is, you know, people say, oh, it needs to be bigger, but you can't, you over fertilize the tree, it dies. You've got to fertilize at the rate that it can absorb the, the nutrients. So I think we're okay. I think it's, you know, it, it, I, it's, I, I don't know any great idea that couldn't get funded. Sure. You know, okay. there's some crazy things that didn't get funded and they shouldn't have got funded, but um, you know, I think, I think that's fine. I think the real issue is talent, and particularly around data science, um, product management as a, as a, as a skill set, but engineering. And, and the crazy thing we have going on in Australia right now is at a time when Trump is telling brown-skinned data scientists to go fuck themselves, um, we should be able to bring them to Australia, yeah. and we've got this moron in Peter Dutton um, <laughs> saying that we don't want to have smart people in this country. It is, it is a bizarre thing when we could be, you know, we know the, ma the, the multiplier of, a, of a, a very good developer or a very good data scientist in terms of creating jobs, and we're just missing a massive opportunity. Yeah, and, and here's the other thing, too. So if you look at the number of computer science graduates that's coming out of the university system here, it's actually declining. Yeah. And half of that really? are foreign nationals, and most of them go back. Yeah. So you have a right. declining population of developers and engineers in a time when, you know, technology is sort of changing the world. This is the wrong formula. Mm. I mean, sort of nuts. Well, um, Let's talk about the sort of Asia opportunity for Australia. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the there's an interesting uh, spot, isn't there, between Silicon Valley, Australia, Asia, a kind of interesting triangle form forming. Do you think, or, or have I misread that? Well, yes and no. I think it depends on, on what the market, what the market. you you know, if you're selling A2 milk, sure, I guess I think China's a big opportunity, or more milk powders, or some things. But but generally speaking, I don't think it ne there's necessarily a large market in China for all the technology offerings. I mean, there will be some, but I think the, the broader issue is, you know, uh, the way we think about it is either you know you've got a, a massive vegetable market in Australia, which could be in financial <laughs> services, you don't need to go anywhere else, or you've got a global market. I don't, th there's not a lot of sectors that necessarily, in a software sense, really say, oh, Asia's the the, the place to go to. Right. I mean, Hyperana, the one one of the great companies we're involved with, has done a couple of um, uh, new customers in Singapore and Hong Kong. That's more from a flight for, for Natalie and Sam to be able to get, as opposed to having to fly to the US. But Hypebanner is a global company, there's no question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, well look, I mean, <coughs> people say, let's sell into Asia. Well, what's Asia? Well, it's actually a whole bunch of different countries. Yeah, you know, sure. it's, it's Thailand, yeah. Hong Kong, and Singapore, mm -hmm. and you know, Vietnam and Indonesia, and they're all different. So they're actually, you know, 11 or 12 different markets. So you can't just sell into yeah. Asia. It's like selling into North America. Well, you know, it's a whole bunch of different. What about, um, so uh, the founder experience is quite, quite different today. Um, uh, what would you say to a new entrepreneur coming into the market with an idea, pitching their way, you know, what sort of advice can you give? Wh wh how should they navigate the startup scene right now? I, I don't, well, I think I think as I said, I think there's enough m there's enough money around. I think obviously it's the same thing as in any other markets: is forming your idea, forming your team, making sure you've got something that's a true deliverable, not just a PowerPoint presentation. And I think targeting the right sort of funding, at the right <coughs> level. I think making sure you're thinking of where your angel funding and then where you're getting your dev talent. I, look, I, I don't think it's particularly different. No, no I, I look, the, the first thing I'd say is just make sure you're solving a real problem. Mm. Okay, yeah. and, and if you're solving a real problem and you can actually sell the product and people are getting high utility value out of it, then the best financing is going to be your customers actually paying for this stuff. That's your first board, that's your first, you know, thing that you should do. And you, uh, and then if you want to find somebody like Daniel or me, they can find us. Well, those like, I mean, Canva was a good example. I think you guys were in, well before us, but then we we're in as well, is that, you know, they had no financial model for a while, but you just saw this a massive adoption rate of yeah. usage and reuse rate. You knew that they would work out a way and of course, they did you know, kind of of business, and then it, and then it took off. But so there are you know, rare models. There are some models where the user adoption and the sure. stickiness and the passion is there even before you get yeah, the monetization. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. I mean, people look. They loved the product. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and there's a number of people in the room who know what Canva is. But I mean, they're just be, they're, they're an amazing founding group. They've got great product market fit. They've got a bunch of business models. But you're right. Yeah. To begin with, they just look for mass market adoption, and then they figured out a way to monetize it. The, the, there was a lot made in Europe of the so-called Israeli model of Keeping your engineering team at home, mm. take sales and marketing over to the uh, over to the value valley, 
Um, is that happening here? Do you yeah. see that uh, happening more? Where are the strengths and weaknesses in that model? Well, I mean, look, it, it used to happen quite a bit, but there's quite a few companies who have the entire teams here now. Right. So, you know, if you look at Canva, for instance, most of the team from Canva, engineering, executive is all here. Mm. Same thing with Culture M. There are, you know, they do have I some places in the U.S. and some people in the U.S. that, you know, are feet on the ground to be able to sell into those markets. But it depends on the business. I mean, yeah. if you're an inbound digital marketing business, um, you can afford to be, you know, here and market to anywhere in the world. Um, if you got to have feet on the street, you got to have. I, more I people think there. having dev teams in Australia it makes economic sense. Yeah. Assuming yeah. you can find the dev developers, yeah. because of the the massive churn you see. I mean, what's the, what's the average tenure of a developer in the valley now? Like 14 months or something. I mean, you know, and, and your price at nearly two x Australian dollars. So, you know, given you can. If you can find the talent, it's a cheaper option and less churn in the Australian market. I still think if, you, if, you're, doing B2, if you're doing some B2B thing or enterprise, yeah. you're going to have to have a sales force in the there. US. But you, you, know, you don't have to do, uh, once you get to Alassian side, you may have these sort of coordinated dev, dev resources around the world. But initially, I think Australia's great. Um, uh, Daniel, you've been very critical about the recent revelations about <laughs> the behaviour of men in venture capital. Yep. Uh, nothing, nothing short of appalling, and yet the response from the VC industry is pathetic at best, you said. Yep. Um, is it uh, improving? How can it improve? Uh, we need to embarrass more people. No, I'm, I'm serious. You, you, I mean, uh, only since I've said that, I'm talking about the r sexual harassment. Yeah, and, and really, if you look at you know what's happened in the U.S. only since the Harvey Weinstein thing has has some serious shit happened in the in in the in the Hollywood part of the U.S. I think we need to call out behaviours of Australian venture capitalists who who've been involved in um, sexual assault. Anyone in assault. particular? I don't know any personal example. I, you know, I'm, I tend not to hang out with those sort of people for maybe obvious reasons. Um, but I think we should create an environment where any men or women who have been sexually assaulted <laughs> feel safe to act. Because that's what happened in the Weinstein case. Yeah. Some very brave women stood up and said, this wasn't right. And, you know, venture capitalists have an enormous amount of power, you know, particularly over founders who have no money, no resources. And, you know, I don't think that Australia is any different from the US where there's been a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. I just, I think we need to call out um, people who've, who've been subjected to any sort of abuse or assault mm. and we need to go after the per perpetrators. Yeah, and 110% yeah. agree. And I think, you know, it's on us to make sure that it happens. I mean, y th you'll know that the uh, industry has changed the moment you see that there's more women than men who are, on the, who are the investment partners at venture firms. Right. Guys, last one. I know that I'm running out of time, but where do we go from here? Wh what's, what's your prediction for the next couple of years, both of you? Well, I think uh, hopefully in all of our portfolios, we've got a bunch of uh, companies that'll be, that are on their way to success. I think the ecosystem is getting richer. Um, the talent pool is getting deeper, which is all great stuff. We're seeing more U.S. venture firms come down here and do some things. Uh, I think that says that, look, there's talent here, there's opportunities here, and we just got to make sure that it, it keeps going and we don't run out of gas. Mm. Yeah, look, I, I, think, yeah um, I think I'll be critical of more people going forward than I have in the past. I think it's probably pretty true. Um, <laughs> you know, consistent, consistent growth, growth curve. But I, no, I think, I think you know, we're in good shape. I think there's enough money coming in, there's some skills coming in. I think we as investors have got to make sure we get a return for our investors. I think it's all very fine to say that you know, founders, if we don't get returns for investors, then we're not going to have more money flowing in. So yeah. our job is to return yeah, yeah. and get more super money in. I think our job is to help influence governments around uh, innovation and immigration. I think that's our job. I think our job is to help, um, you know, Create a better culture for, for founders, and uh, I'm super positive about Australia. I think we're, we're in a, we, this is the engine room of the next country is coming out of startups and innovation. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Bill Bartry and Daniel Petrie, thank you so much Pleasure. for coming to Startup Battle Australia. Thank you. Thanks.